record button. Good evening, everybody. We are now recording. This is our first session of Client Artist Works 12 with our guest experts. And tonight's first guest is Miles Manning. Miles, good evening. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I think I'm going to switch this to speaker view so we can see Miles bigger and probably the same thing in the recording. Hi, Miles. Um, how long have you and I known each other? Uh, I think it goes back to the mid 80s, probably 86 or 87. Is Glenn Jample involved in this? Uh, we, after we met already, we met in Chicago at a Navy Pier show. How fascinating. All right, let's go back even earlier. Where did you grow up? Uh, I came from North Dakota. Uh, my family moved to Philadelphia when I was a little kid. Uh, my dad was, you know, studying medicine and back there, then there were so few people in, uh, North Dakota, you had a transfer to finish. So that's how we got to the East coast. I went to school in the Midwest, uh, Knox college, which is uh, a lot of people from Chicago know about that school. Galesburg. Galesburg, Illinois. That's right. And then, uh, came back home after school, briefly lived at home, took some courses at Tyler and Philadelphia college of art courses. What did, at what did you major in at Knox? Uh, originally I was a biology major, but, uh, by the time I was a sophomore, I had as many art courses as biology. So I ended up being a double major and realizing I wasn't going to do anything with the bi biology, which sort of became botany, uh, my main interest. Uh, I switched the order of them so that, uh, when I applied to graduate school, eventually that would you know, be more appropriate. When so I applied to a bunch of schools, uh, got into Pratt and moved to New York in uh, the winter of 77. And uh, at first, before I went into fine arts, I s signed up for a program called environmental design, which turned out to be like a mixture between architecture and uh, interior decorating. And it wasn't what I thought it to be. <laughs> and so I switched over to painting and printmaking, and then I got my master's uh, two years there. When did you first discover an interest in art? Was this high school or before or in college? Uh, growing up, my father was a physician, but he um, collected art. Uh, I guess when I was as young as junior high school, as a family, we used to go down to uh, the Delaware River. There's a town called New Hope uh, and Lambertville is a sister town across and both sides of the uh, river have uh, small art galleries, uh, restaurants, etc. And we would go on Sundays as a family. I had three younger sisters and we would go to these galleries and my dad and mom would buy art. And then my mom was a school teacher, but she was also an amateur watercolor painter. Took lessons at it and was pretty good actually. And so it was sort of uh, ingrained. I was supposed to be a doctor. That was, you know, I was the oldest son and my father was a doctor. So you're supposed to follow in your father's footsteps, but that didn't work out so well. But so that art came natural. It was just sort of part of my daily existence growing up. So I. Uh, but you didn't think you were going to grow up to be an artist when you were a, a little kid or a kid. No, I was part of the generation that didn't know what we were going to do. Now remember us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so you got out. Go along, more or less. Yep. So you got out of Pratt. You I graduated. Of, uh, I got a job uh, working for a short time at Stereo Studios which was a printmaking concern. It was really a sweatshop. Uh, their idea of a bonus was they sent someone out, usually the, the, the most recently guy hired on Friday, which was payday, to go to the liquor store and buy a bottle of vodka and a bottle of uh, whiskey. And then when they gave out the paychecks, everybody had a shot. And it was run by these Austrian uh, guys who were printmakers. And we, I worked on things ranging from uh, Rauschenberg, gluing little rulers down on multiples to uh, Alex Katz's and to Ro Leroy Neiman's. So it was quite a divergent uh, print shop. And uh, it, yeah. was, it was run like a sweatshop. And I, I guess at that youthful age, I had a problem with a uh, time card and so forth. And I was reading Did Walden you meet these artists? Did you meet Rauschenberg or anybody else or Leroy? Uh, no. Uh, Yes, uh, he came in to sign like a pile of prints, but it was, he was guarded by everybody, the senior people, so you didn't really get to talk to him. But very shortly thereafter, uh, I didn't last there but a couple months, 
and probably happily so because a lot of brain cells would, would be killed there. They didn't have like masks when you were dealing with benzene and all these chemicals. This was uh, 1979, we're talking. And uh, so I, I got a job working in a uh, frame shop. I was walking my girlfriend at the time worked for John Weber Gallery. And uh, we were still in graduate school in our, our last, well, you just, I had just graduated, but she was finishing up. And uh, anyway, I was walk on my way to her and there was a sign in Jerry Joseph's frame shop. So I started working for him. And again, that didn't last that long, not that he let me go, but because I got hired by John Weber. But in the interim, I had a short stint of freelance installation. One of our clients was Ed Thorpe, and uh, I got to hang April Gornick's first show with him and uh, with her boyfriend, Eric Fischel. So that was the first time I met artists that became quote unquote significant or semi-famous or famous, whatever you want to call them. And they were uh, nice, you know, honest people. And uh, to this day, when I run into Eric on the street, he recognizes me, says hello, asks me how it's going. Uh, it's unlike many other people that are not like that. So. Wow. Um, yeah, Eric's a really good guy. We did a webinar with him, I think it was last fall, and we're doing one with April. They're now married. They were, they were a couple for, what, 25 years or something before they finally got married? Um, something yeah, for a long time. For a long time. And they're both really wonderful people. I'm, you know, it's, it's really pleasing. Um, all right, so then what happened? So then I worked for John Weber Gallery. Um, uh, John fired the uh, registrar there, so the prepared a registrar, um, Anthony. So who, Tana, uh, how, how, how prepared were you for that job? I mean, it was sort of like serendipity, or was there a formal application process? How did this happen? So that's, a big, <laughs> that's a big move, a big step in your career. Uh, well, <laughs> John... I guess I, sh I can tell this story. Uh, uh, John asked me what I had done recently, and I said, well, I just got out of jail. Um, <laughs> um, a friend from Chicago that uh, he came to visit, he was looking at grad schools in New York, and he was going to go on to Mardi Gras, and I didn't know anybody in New York. I'd just been there a few months, and he wanted to get some pot to take to Mardi Gras with him. And so I took him back home to where I grew up in Philadelphia. And we had dinner with my parents. And then we went and bought from these older guys. We called them grandfathers of pot. And then we drove downtown and went to some jazz bars. And, and we're driving back to New York. And since I was a student, I had no money. So I couldn't afford the Jersey Turnpike tolls. So I uh, took back roads. And since we'd been drinking beer, we had a stop to pee on the side of the roads, like 3 in the morning. And we were getting back in the car and just as we start to pull off the shoulder, red cherries come flashing on. It was a state trooper just wandering down this lonely route near uh, George Washington crossing. So he had 50 bucks on him. So he had his bail. I had, I had $6. So I spent the night in Trenton state prison. So when John said, you know, what have you been doing lately? I said, I just got out of jail for busted for pot. And he said, okay, well you're hired. <laughs> It awesome. Pretty, yeah, it was a different time. <laughs> and we, I don't think the application process goes quite like that anymore, but that's probably how Probably not. Was Alice Acock working with John Weber at that time? Yeah, she was, and I quickly got to meet her and uh, uh, Robert Ryman, who actually had just left the gallery, and I met him because I had to return something to his studio, and he was very nice. Solowit was an active participant at that point, and Robert Mangold and, and Mel Kendrick and on and on. So good memory. Yeah. It was um, good. How long did you work with John? Uh, I moved him uh, from 420 West Broadway, where he was on the fourth floor, to uh, uh, Green Street, 142 Green Street, which was sort of the, the uh, eastward expansion of, of uh, Soho at the time. Soho was you know, growing and growing. And uh, so I guess it was almost three years. And then I realized that, well, John, the, I, my goal at this point was to become a curator slash director or whatever. And my uh, road to the top there was kind of cut off because John's girlfriend was the director. So uh, I figured, well, I have, you know, I've done enough time here. It's time to move on. So I started, I was friendly with the people at Castelli and they didn't have any downtown openings, but there was a spot opening up town at Castelli Graphics. So I got myself hired up there and uh, 
moved up there and they opened a uh, short-lived space that lasted for just shy of two years on the west side near Central Park West, which has you know, completely been redeveloped. Uh, it's called Castelli Graphics West, and we did a number of really innovative shows, one with the Nimslo Corporation with the 3D camera, another one was a survey of black and white printmaking, which John Russell of the New York Times reviewed. Unfortunately, we, the, the day after the review, we had 18 inches of snow, so nobody came. But uh, it was a good time there. It was a good learning experience. And then I went from there to uh, uh, Grace Borgnick Gallery, and uh, that's when I met you during that period in the mid-'80s. Interesting. I remember inviting Mark Tanzi out for lunch, dinner um, right after his first show with Borgenick, and we went out to dinner, and I think he had sold, what, almost every painting in the show, and the five of them at least had gone to significant museums, and he hadn't been, it was right after the opening, and he hadn't been paid anything, so that here was someone, Mark Tanzi, T-A-N-S-E-Y, on the, on the threshold of a really significant career and a significant beginning, you know, but he couldn't have paid for dessert. Um, right. You know, I mean, that's how it is sometimes in the art world. How long were you, with, how long were you working with Borgenick? I worked with Grace for eight years. I, actually, I had inside information that uh, there was a little coup d'etat that happened there. Uh, there was Ann Philbin and Kurt Marcus. Uh, and Kurt was the director and Annie was his assistant. And uh, I got hired there as the registrar, but Annie's girlfriend uh, told... Uh, friend of my wife, well, became my wife, uh, that they were going to leave in a year and start their own gallery. So that's why I took that job. And uh, literally almost to a day, they, a year later, they did leave. And they took all those artists. Um, so Grace was actually bitter at Kurt because uh, uh, his grandmother was a friend of hers. So he, she wouldn't allow me to use the term director. I had to call myself the curator, <laughs> which is fine. And Right. And that's and so I essentially did the same thing. I also promised to her that I would never, you know, leave and steal her artists uh, you know, that were developed at her expense. So didn't they represent Milton Avery? Uh, yes, they did, and Max Beckman and Stuart Davis. And it was, it was a really interesting gallery because you had all these estates of uh, blue chip artists, and then yet she encouraged within her gallery a, a young program. And I was in my mid thirties at the time. And she wanted to take on younger artists at the same time. So uh, she was an interesting lady to work for. She, let's, uh, let's talk about that for a moment. What, so you, you've got three different tiers or branches of artists, right? You've got young artists, established blue chip artists, and dead artists, significant dead artists with estates. Right. Um, what's the difference with how, in how galleries deal with those kinds of situations? Uh, well, in her case, she had a, a large staff. Like my primary concern was to work with finding young artists and dealing with those shows. I mean, I did work. Uh, I, you know, I, in my time there, I did sell an Avery gouache and I sold a few Wolf Con paintings, but that wasn't my concern. There were other people that dealt with those artists, so the the staff was divided. Uh, gallery where I work now, it's just you know Elizabeth and I. We, we do everything, so you don't have that luxury. And because of time passing, we have a few estates. They're not, they're not necessarily blue chip estates, but nonetheless, we have estates. Um, so it's a very different experience. Uh, what, 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 um, would an artist, would a young artist want to be with a gallery like Borgenek that spends a fair amount of their energy in other directions? Is that good for them? Not good, or it's a trade-off? Um, well, I think it was a really, in this case, it was a really good thing for, you mentioned Tansy, et cetera. Besides, you know, on their own merits, they were surrounded uh, when you were showing someone their work. Uh, you know, you had an Avery on the wall, you have a Beckman, so if you can stand up in that company, you look pretty good. You also had existing relationships with museums that would be interested yeah, in the museums. Yeah, and also very well-known collectors and uh, great people. You know, those kind of people would come in and she'd say, well, you know, you're looking at this back, like, what about Steve Curry over here? You should, you really should have one of these. And, you know, oftentimes those people would trust her at her word and 
and invest and buy a young artist, you know, for a fraction of what they're normal normally would pay you know, for an age. That's true. So under what circumstances did you leave that Grace Borgen gallery? Uh, what just happened here? The Gosian gallery came up on screen with Tansy paintings. <laughs> this is yeah. weird. Okay. I hope it doesn't mess up my recording. Somebody, who did that? Somebody undo it. Yeah. Keep on, all right, so you, uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I, if I can stop that. I gotta figure this one out. I didn't do it. Um, so how did you leave the, uh, what happened with, with the gallery? Um, there was a, there was a power balance there. Um, there was myself and then there was uh, a gentleman, Mac Chambers, who was a uh, vice president who dealt mainly with the estates, et cetera. And then there was a woman who was kind of uh, Grace's personal assistant. And so whenever there was a decision to be made, we would vote. And uh, this woman, Caroline, was often in my camp. So I would win a lot of votes two to one. And, and so, you know, that would, uh, things would go my way. And so it was, I had a great run there. But then at a certain point, her daughter, and one of her daughters came up and, from Delaware and started spending four days a week there. And, working in the gallery. And so then there was another vote and uh, it would be a tie. So ties go to blood. <laughs> right. so, so I could see the handwriting on the wall. So I thought it was time to move on. So I, I started to look elsewhere. So and you looked I, for something else. Yeah, I did. And then I, I, I left and uh, I, uh, I got a, uh, well, I had a period where I didn't work for a year. Actually, I worked as a plumber. Uh, I, when I lived in East Village, I had a friend uh, who was a musician, who uh, was a drummer for Stephen Reich, and uh, he was also a plumber and a, a shaman and many other things. But uh, he, he lived, since I lived in a cold water flat and had a bathtub, I wanted to have a real shower. So he, in exchange for a, a war hole, I gave him, and, and buying the materials, he did the plumbing work, but I was his assistant. So he taught me how to sweat pipe, et cetera. So when I needed a job for a short time, I, I worked for him. And it was interesting when you change hats, you go into uh, galleries and people that knew you. And when you wear like a work jacket and a baseball hat, you know, they just, you're invisible. They don't see you. It was a really, really interesting experience. <laughs> Cause yeah. I mean, people I'd done business with, they, they would just look, looked right through me. It was like I was invisible because I had working men's clothes. It was very, very interesting lesson in human nature. Um, so anyway, that got through that, and then uh, well, how did you end up? How did you leave the plumbing gig into something more substantive? Well, what happened was uh, because you know I had been around for a while. I had connections and dealers out, and uh, there was an exciting new project called uh, DCA Gallery, Danish Contemporary Art, and. Uh, they were looking for someone to run a space and they were doing a pilot project at 420 West Broadway on the ground floor where German's Van Eck gallery used to be. Oh, right. Do you remember German's Van Eck? And before yeah. that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Delivery and Mary Boone, actually. That's where she originally started. There was a little tiny space and that was hers. And uh, they asked me, uh, some of, I had dealt with, I had met some of the, these dealers through working at Borgnick and uh, one of the artists that this one dealer showed, you know, put my name into the mix and uh, I was flown over to Copenhagen and I had interviews with uh, seven different galleries, which constituted the DCA gallery and a luncheon with the Ministry of Culture, the Kultura Ministriet. And uh, so I, what became a one year gig with a two-year option turned into an 11-year run so but it was all it was an interesting job because it was always at the beck and call of politics danish politics and uh so you had the sort of damocles hanging over your head you never knew there was always people that were jealous and the papers you know saying oh why should the danish state give money to this blah 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 and you were always in you know danger in your job so uh, it was, but it was a great, great experience. I went to Denmark every summer in August and you know, met artists and networked over there. And 
But you never spoke Danish, right? No, I, I tried to learn. It's a difficult language. And even when you get it 95% uh, right, they look at you like you're speaking Chinese or Greek or something. And, and then when you say the same word with a bad American accent, they immediately understand you. So uh, it was a little frustrating, to say the least. So how different was that? Was that how do you feel? Was that, that was a real strange job because it was, uh, I had like, almost complete autonomy. And actually that job in, entailed uh, this transition from the Soho area to the Chelsea area because um, the owners of the space that we were in on the ground floor, they realized that real estate was about to explode in Soho with all the boutiques and so forth. And we were paying when we left there $15,000 a month and for, for 5,000 square feet, and they, no, actually no, it was uh, 8,000 square feet. And they wanted us to move upstairs to the fourth floor or whatever, and we said, no, 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 and then they started offering increasing you know, lucrative sums of money. And finally, they said, well, what do you want? And, they said, and well, the guy who, the Dane whose idea it was, he and I said, well, you know, Chelsea is where it's at. I said, so we told them, find us a location in Chelsea. So they did, right across from Matthew Mark's gallery on 525 West uh, 22nd Street, just down from the Dia Foundation. And they found us that, and they offered us $250,000 to break our lease. And that was our renovation budget. And I used my ex-brother-in-law, his architecture firm, Bona Levine, and I delivered on the dollar for that to the Danes, which they're frugal people. They appreciated that. And uh, we had a great space. And, and that opened in 97, October 97, and ran until the end of the season of uh, 2005. And then they closed? They closed. What happened was in Denmark, uh, in, I guess it would be 2002, uh, the equivalent of the Republicans uh, elected, uh, although by our standards they would be Democrats, <laughs> but yes. nonetheless they they were. And that, the irony is they're they're called the Venstre Party, which means left, and they're not left. But anyway, they're conservative, and they wanted to undo everything that the Social Democrats, who founded the DCA. And every, every program, and one by one, they unraveled all those programs, did their own in their own way, but they didn't want the handiwork of their predecessors on anything. And we were one of the last things to get the ax. So out of the blue in February of that year, I got a, 2005, I got an email from a bureaucrat in the, in the ministry saying that uh, the job was gonna end uh, very shortly. And so I started feeling around and I found a directorship at uh, Elizabeth Harris Gallery. So what, 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 all right, so let's talk about the present then. Um, what does a director of a gallery do when the gallery is owned by somebody else? Well, if you went historically back and looked at, if you had a snapshot of the artist page, uh, September of 2005, when I started and look at it now, you'd see, see over 50% of the artists have changed. So I've put my imprint on the, the gallery. How long, did, how long was Elizabeth Leach around before your arrival? Harris, Elizabeth Harris. I'm sorry, Elizabeth Harris. I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, Excuse me. That's okay. Uh, she is an interesting woman. She actually is from Chicago, and um, her uh, father was a landscape golf architect, and, uh, and she has some money that she inherited from him, and she started, she was still painting. She came to New York in the 60s, was studying painting, she studied with Pat Paslov, uh, who we represent, and she at first started a gallery called Oscarson Hood, which was in the 80s, and she was a silent partner Hood, and that was her mother's maiden name, because she was still painting at the time, and she didn't want you know, to, so she wasn't there, she was just basically a silent partner, but the money behind it. And then um, she closed that gallery, and uh, for various reasons, and then there was a period where she didn't have a gallery and then she was miserable and her husband who was a painter victor said well why don't you just open another gallery you know, this, and you're not painting anymore so just do it yourself so that's what she did in 92 and she opened on uh i think in the building where dean and deluca was on, uh, or still is actually on broadway uh so in 1992 so the gallery is uh started there and then in 97 uh she moved to 
our present location, which is the 529 West 20th Street building, which was one of the first buildings developed in the Chelsea. Cool. I want to know more about what you do. What do I do? Uh, <laughs> well, first thing I do is unlock the doors and turn off the alarm. But after that, I, uh, I start going through email and correspondence. I, I get queries from collectors, from uh, artists that are interested in showing in the gallery. Um, we, if you look at our website, it says on the last, the about page or whatever, the contact page, uh, that we don't accept uh, submissions, which is essentially true, but not true. Uh, we don't accept submissions in the old way of sending us an envelope full of slides or CDs or whatever materials you have. If you send a, an email with a link to a website, I'll always click on the link and, you know, I'll either look at it for 30 seconds or, you know, 20 minutes and then later show it to uh, Elizabeth when she comes in if it's interesting. And I found some artists, uh, an artist we show, Lachlan Gowdy from Scotland. He, he, I discovered him that way and... There's a few others. Uh, so that's one thing I do. And then I install all the exhibitions. Uh, and uh, that's something I you know, profess to be very good at. Uh, many people have said the same. I enjoy it the most. Uh, since I don't paint anymore, uh, I sort of, that's my uh, creativity outlet is to install exhibitions and work with an artist. Uh, right now we have a group show up and uh, I don't know how well it translates from the installation shots, which were hastily shot on my iPhone, but you know you can see get a flavor for. You can go back and look at the you know installation views of the different shows we do there. How many people work for the gallery? Uh, it's just Elizabeth and I, and then we hire uh, occasionally someone to come in and do web work for us, uh, or uh, uh, another woman comes in and. I kind of design the announcements, but um, for me, cut and paste means using scissors and tape and uh, glue. So I, I, I can design something, but it, I can't do it on Photoshop in design. How much, how much of a say have you had in the, the gallery transition, the new artists that have come on while you've been there? I said uh, over 50%. So... I remade the gallery from my predecessor. First thing I did was change the opening color of the, of the uh, website from orange to green. <laughs> so it's I have a you know, fair amount of influence Elizabeth's very uh, easy to work with she's a great person and uh, you know she believes in what I, in my vision and she, I enjoy working with her how much time is she at the gallery compared to you uh, well she's considerably older than me so I mean she comes later and she usually stays the rest of the day, but she's, uh, she's there every, every day, but she comes in around midday. She has appointments. She does exercise class and so forth. Who, do, who does most of the selling? Uh, we both do. I'd say probably since I'm I mean, the person that answers emails, et cetera, it, it's me. I'm the one who sends out the images and so forth. Where do, are all the artists alive? Uh, everybody except for her husband, uh, Victor Pesha, who died in 2010. And passed How many artists does the gallery represent? 25, I think. Um, where do they live? Uh, some live in, most of them live in New York. We have uh, one who lives in Paris, one lives in London, one li lives in Glasgow, and... Uh, Let's see where else. Uh, one lives in Durham, North Carolina, uh, and did when we found him. He, he used well, to live. What, what percentage of the gallery? Excuse me. What percentage of the artists live in New York City? Uh, I'm just trying to think. Then there's like Bosman. He lives upstate. So I mean, I don't know. I'd say eighty percent in the city. Okay. And what's the age range? Is pretty. How old is the youngest artist? Youngest artist, she is uh, 31. And the oldest artist is deceased, but I mean the oldest living artist? Uh, it, would be, uh, it would be Thornton Willis. He's uh, 78, I believe. Is there any, is there, does, does anyone pay attention to the gender balance? Uh, I do. Um, <laughs> I've made an effort to uh, sort of, uh, also when I curate shows, to try to keep it balanced. Uh, 
I was aware of the Guerrilla Girls when I was working in, at Borgnick in the 80s and their efforts to address that issue. And, uh, you know, as a conscientious person, I've tried to do the same. Uh, I think it's fairly, pretty much 50-50. I actually haven't counted it, but you can go on our artist page and count it up yourself. Some names are deceptive, so you might have to ask me what gender they are. Does the gallery have a given aesthetic? Uh, we, we predominantly like painting uh, uh, with some sculpture. Uh, we don't really delve in video art or photography, per se. Uh, quality is our utmost goal, no matter what. Uh, in the painting realm, I'd say it's more geared towards abstraction uh, with some figurative art. Uh, there's also a strong interest in sort of where landscape, landscape meets abstraction, that sort of twilight point going in and out. Is that an extension of your taste? Uh, yeah, both. I mean, actually, it was kind of easy. I, things have more and evolved since I've been there, and uh, we uh, generally agree on most things. Uh, do you, have, do you have an interest in having your own gallery? Uh, or do you, or essentially you do? Yeah, I, I guess I have the, the benefits without the costs here. I mean, I, I feel as I have as much autonomy as I would if I was my own gallery, other than I can leave at the end of the day. And if it was literally my name on the shingle, then I would have to be working 24 seven because it's, you know, got backing and it's you know, independent of me I don't have and it's not an obtrusive I mean many galleries fail because of obtrusive backing so to speak and I since I didn't win the lotto I'm not uh, interested in that and galleries are you know it's a hard struggle to make money I mean not every there's there's quote unquote the uh, the big boys like Kagosian and uh, and uh, Swerner our neighbor down the street but uh, those are that's a different kind of gallery. Uh, it's, it's a phenomenon that's arisen in the last 20 years that uh, that's, that's not what I would want to be. I, would, I, I actually was offered a, a job or an interview up at Nodler. <laughs> and now nobody would want to be at Nodler. But this was back in the late 90s. And you know, the, sal the starting salary was more than twice what I was making. But I said, I don't want to work uptown. You, you, you couldn't pay me enough. Even no. It's not about the money for me. It's about the, uh, the aesthetic and working with the artist and, and the quality and the fact that like when you come to our gallery, like there's a price list on the table as the law prescribes and the prices are there and there's none of this bullshit. Yeah, use swear words on your thing here. But anyway, I, no I, it really irks me that when I walk into a gallery that I have to be like, a person to get a price and it should, it should just be there in plain sight. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you, a, a gallery you would be associated with is more human. Yeah. 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 We, uh, I'm resisting humane, but yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. but you know, I kind of like that. And so I, I want to go back to these artists that have, how many, art, so a dozen or so artists have come onto the gallery, into the gallery because of your initiation, or because right. of your participation. Right. How many of those artists were you familiar with other than them sending an email and you didn't know? I mean, I'm, I'm wondering how, how much of it was cold calling, send an email to Miles, or how much of it was an existing relationship? or you heard from somebody else that you represent, or, you know. Well, I, brought, I brought two from the Danish experience. Uh, one who uh, does very, very well <laughs> in terms of sales, who I uh, tried to uh, bring, I offered, uh, one, of, one of my jobs at my previous job was to, to get these, these Danish artists, New York galleries, and I went around to various galleries, and. I, one of which is the one I'm working for and said, you should take this artist on, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you'll do very well. And they said, oh, well, our schedule's all filled up. So I got the same kind of rejection that, you know, an artist does. You know. I said, fine. But I gave him, like, the catalog resume anyway. And after I'd been working there for six months, I pulled that down off the 
shelf and I said, you know, we should consider this woman. And, and then I reiterated my pitch and she said, sure, go for it. So I sent her a fax. She doesn't do email. I sent a fax to Paris and uh, they were, she was overjoyed and we did a show and uh, it was a big shock <laughs> when, when uh, almost everything sold. Elizabeth had never experienced that before. That must and have made you a popular guy. It did and and then she had got another shock from her accountant when the next year she had to pay projected taxes because she was making money. <laughs> yeah. And she said, I said, well, if we don't make money this year, you'll get it back. Don't worry. So, but she said she had never been in that position before. So it was a new experience. And uh, so I had other suggestions and I just went through everything, you know, the way the gallery was done and having worked for the Danes, I was kind of good at cost cutting and finding cheaper ways to do things and so forth. So. My sense is that a lot of gallery relationships, well, a lot of gallery relationships end up as an extension of relationships. Somebody meets you at a party, a function, an opening. Um, you know, the, you listen to one artist and they tell you about another artist, things That's like true. that. What, That's what's true. your experience? It's very true. Social uh, interaction is a very big part, but sometimes though there's artists that you like personally as a friend but you're just not into their work totally and sure that's, and that's really difficult sometimes you know because you have this strong friendship uh there's another artist uh sculptor sculptor steve curry who we show and i discovered him up at yale when i was at borgnick it was one of my first discoveries and and grace borgnick went wild over him and she uh when uh what's his name uh well, the guy from the Met, who's long deceased now, from the contemporary, he came down and he liked the piece, and she said, "Well, fine." And she she bought, you know, paid Steve's the, her his percentage and gave it to the Met, and she did that for many artists. Uh, she, she was good about that. And uh, so anyway, I, our paths diverged. I did this thing with the Danes, so but he kept me informed by sending me postcards of various things. And then uh, when I started this job, um, we went to a sculptor's studio and she uh, said, oh, I'm not ready and didn't want to do a show. And I said, well, I've just been to this friend of mine, Steve's. We should go to his studio. And so she did. Elizabeth went and she loved his work. And so we gave him a show and he's become a gallery artist. And he said a very nice thing to me. He said, it's not often you get two chances in life. And he said, both times you've been there. So I thought that was a nice compliment. Yeah, that's that's really true. Um, how often do why do relationships with artists terminate, and how do you do that? Uh, <laughs> well, that's a difficult thing. Um, I don't know. Uh, it should art, be. <laughs> yeah, it 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 is. Um, I mean, artists sometimes don't think a gallery is doing enough for them, and they leave or on their own accord or they see the grass is greener somewhere else that happens all the time or they start to get uh, success and then they want to go up the next level if they, if you see uh you know galleries as steps to the top uh, so to speak uh, we had one of those uh, she uh, did very well and she went to one gallery from us and then went to another one and so forth so so that happens, and um, and then there's some some artists can be difficult to deal with. And uh, I said, you know, to Elizabeth, I said, well, you know, there's lots of artists that are not difficult to deal with, <laughs> and that are good too. So, I mean, unless this artist is making you a really a lot of money, you know, you should reconsider whether you want to continue that relationship. So uh, it's difficult um, if when it comes to parting. Uh, I, we, I prefer the organic uh, form where the artist decides that they don't want to be with us. I, we don't really, per se, tell people to leave. How many group shows do you do a year? Uh, generally, one. We've actually changed our schedule about a year ago. We have changed from having five Saturdays, five week shows, to six. So that changes the calendar. It's better for the artists that are having a show because not every artist gets a show every two years. Sometimes it's three, so, you know, sometimes it's four or even five. It depends on some artists work very slowly. 
some artists you know, just don't feel like they're ready to have a show every two years uh, or want that uh, or have other commitments elsewhere so that they, they can't. And uh, so we, we went to this system of six. So what that does in the fall is we have two shows and then we have a short time period uh, right at uh, before Christmas, uh, like two and a half to th almost three weeks. And uh, so last year we did a show called Holiday Delights, which was like a little throwaway. I invited all the gallery artists to invite a friend. And I'd say about, you know, 40% of them chose their spouse or significant other. <laughs> Safe bet. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, that was one thing. But then this year, we we're going to be doing a historical show in October, uh, Pat Paslov, introducing works that have never been seen by her from the 50s. Because uh, so, she only started exhibiting in the 60s, and she studied with the Kooning, etc. So... Uh, this is part of the Resnick uh, Paslov Foundation. They're behind it in ourselves. And uh, so that show will go almost eight weeks, which is good for something of you know, that importance. Well, what I'm trying to get at is, though, from these group shows where you're where artists oh, that you have worked with. People. If you go back and look at uh, the first show I, I did when I started working there the very first summer, it was called Neoplastic Redux. We took on Th uh, Thornton Willis. Uh, and then, uh, God, my memory's not going to... Well, that doesn't matter, but do, I'm not, your memory, I, mean, I don't have one every, either. Not every show do we take on an artist, but sometimes we do. But Thornton Willis was a known commodity by the time he was doing a group show with you. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Were there, were there artists, were there artists that, that were... A sharp, a sharp foundation, for instance, Martha Klippinger, uh, we, she's the youngest artist. Uh, three years ago, I went to Sharp Foundation because of a, a group show I was curating and one woman was in my group show was at that so that's she had they had open studios so I felt obligated to go to that so I did but I said well I'm here I might as well look in all the other doorways so I did and I saw Martha's work and then I got her card she was busy talking to somebody I didn't even speak to her and then I uh, had Elizabeth write to her and was you know and, and so then we set up a studio visit and uh, we invited her to do a show. And now she's had a second show, and she's right now she got Fulbright. She's studying uh, uh, color, dyeing of colors and uh, fabrics in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. Interesting. All right. Hey, you guys, let's see if you have some questions. I'm going to go to Barbara Friedman. And Barbara, I see your question. Now I have to figure out how to unmute you. I can do this. Um, Barbara, you are unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question of Miles. Where's Barbara? I don't see Barbara. <laughs> Barbara, you muted yourself. I'm unmuted. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. I'm curious if the trends in art affect the way the gallery's vision progresses. Uh, no, I. <laughs> we're untrendy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I can just there. You, now I can see. I only can see the top of your head before in the lamp. <laughs> That's kind of UFO thing going on there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, no, uh, no, I, I, I don't really care what trends in art are. It's, that's, there are other people to worry about that. Thank you, Barbara. Thank um, you. Michael, I like your question. If you guys, you know, you don't, you can say you have a question. I'm not going to screen your questions. I trust that it's not too prurient. Um, Michael, go ahead. Ask your question. I was wondering, how do you go about setting pricing with the artist? Hmm. Um, well, that's a that's a difficult question. Uh, generally, uh, if you're say, let's start out. Say you're a young artist, you just got out of graduate school. If you're a young person, or if you haven't have no exhibition record, you, I suggest starting at a reasonable amount. You know, thousand to $2,000 range because the idea is to sell your work and make it accessible to people and you have your whole life and career to raise your prices and if you raise them too quickly then you're stuck with that price structure and it's hard to go back down uh, there are techniques for doing that which I you you downsize what you paint you make smaller paintings but you keep the prices the same and but it's not uh, it's not an easy it's better not to put yourself in that situation I mean 
there are artists that had a lot of success like in the 80s and then their prices got real high and you know and then you, you go to an auction house and you see that in the 90s the work wasn't worth anything and they're trying to, to deal with that and uh, uh, so anyway I just believe in a certain amount of caution I mean it also changes when you know you have an estate if somebody dies then the price is there's not going to be any, it's a finite amount of art so you have to obviously raise the price considerably then is it typically a 50 50 split yes yeah that's that's the way we work uh we work when we work with a gallery uh in another city we ask for the first show like 10% for, for us and 40% to that gallery and then the artist 50%. Uh, in, in the city, it's 25-25 uh, with another gallery. It's like one of our artists is in a group show and we share the first 10% discount. Um, and, uh, and then if, you're, if a gallery, say you have a gallery in California and they approach us and they want to do a show, if you do a second show with them, we just uh, walk away and just you know, let you work directly with them. I mean, not all galleries are like that, but that's that was the way I was raised by John Weber and Costelli and others. Uh, so after how long a period of time? After the first show, like it, the, the first, first show, show, the initial, okay. you know, we asked for ten percent, and then after that, if they the gallery in say Chicago or wherever, wants right? To, I don't do think it. that's the norm for most New York galleries. Yeah, I, think I, I would hope so. Although I did get a. Uh, consignment form in-house uh, offering us more 30%, you know, and, and they got 20% and I just scratched out their numbers and wrote 25, 25 and signed it and sent it back. I'm sure they were shocked, but I mean, I, I, did, I, I didn't, I just couldn't comprehend. That's cool. <laughs> I like that. It's All right. Nice. Ann, you have a question. Go ahead, Ann. Yeah. yeah hi. Um, Will you seek out a, a new market for a new artist whose work is doesn't sell to your usual market? Will you create a market for them? Uh, well, I don't know if we can really create a market. I mean, there's a there's only a finite number of collectors around, and and and. Uh, and that's one of the things I've learned in changing jobs is uh, when I applied for certain jobs, people would say, oh, well, what is your collector list? And I, I looked at the person like, what are you talking about? It's the same collectors that you have that everybody has. We all have the same lists. People that go to art galleries, they sign up essentially to be on lists. So it, the art itself, I mean, I can't say I couldn't create a market if I'm showing your work, I think there is a market. So therefore, hopefully something happens. If not the first time, maybe the second time, or as your work evolves. But I mean, it's like a dealer is not a magician. You just can't go out and create a market. I, and we have- It sounds like you don't um, choose work that you don't think that you can sell. Oh, well, if you look at our roster, we have quite a bit of work that doesn't sell. <laughs> So I wouldn't say that's true. There are galleries, and I won't name any names, that specifically choose work that can sell. And, but uh, we're not one of those galleries. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Angie, your turn. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thanks so much for sharing, Miles. I appreciate um, yeah, sure. you. Um, I'm curious how an artist can help their gallerist sell their work. You know, what can we do to help move things along if the gallery isn't successfully kind of moving yeah, well, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, some, that's a great question because some, a lot of artists say, oh, once they get a gallery, they, oh, they're on easy street, they can just kick back and just paint in their studio, et cetera. But I learned very early on, like, uh, from a really well-known artist, Saul Witt. He was very proactive. Um, he, he, he found out who bought his work. He, you know, we, we, we share, like, our copies of our receipts so you know you have the addresses of the collector so whenever he was doing something or when he was in Spoleto in Italy he would write a postcard and send from Spoleto and do like a drawing on a postcard a back of a postcard and send it to these people so I mean you, you are responsible it's your career I mean as I said we have 25 artists we represent and there's two of us so think about it I mean as soon as we 
get your show up, then we're already like trying to design the next card. And that's like, we're, you know, we're always, of course, I mean, you, you, can, you can multitask, but the artists can do a lot. You like come in on Saturday and hang out if they have the time, interact with collectors and people that are interested in the work. Um, write letters, like I said, you know, write notes to critics because we can't hound, uh, if you want to get a review, we can't like write every, to Roberta Smith, we can't write every month to her. She's going to get pissed off and not even come to the gallery anymore. And, you know, and I'm actually friendly with her, so I, you know, I, I don't do that. And only in very gr grave circumstances have I ever I reached out to her like that. Uh, but uh, an artist can, you know, you can, Play, play the naive card or whatever and just, you know, just write a letter and it works. <laughs> You'd be surprised. And, and a, a handwritten letter is much better for him than an email. Okay. So it's a stamp, a stamp goes a long way. It shows some, I probably don't have to consider getting a letter to an email. Especially from guys because, you know, women do it more naturally than men do it. And when a man sends a handwritten you know, letter with a stamp on it, right. You know, yeah. some, whoa, look what I got. Um, it makes, yeah, you know, yeah. somebody pays Let's attention. Go back to that Steve Curry story. The first, he had his first show, and he didn't know anything. He was originally from Michigan. He went to Yale. He moved to New York. He wrote to Michael Brenson and said, I have a show up. I'd like you to come see it. Well, Brenson did, and he reviewed it, and then everything sold. It was an amazing story, but it's true. You know, so people do react to human interaction. You just... Um, the unfortunate downside is there's so much rejection. I mean, I, I don't envy. I mean, I was an artist. I sort of <laughs> became a dealer because I just couldn't really deal with being rejected all the time. It's hard. I don't, I don't envy the artist because I'd say, you know, 99 times out of 100, you're going to get no. So it's a hard thing to keep hearing. But how, if you keep how, how, how do you – how many artists – got a few questions here that – how many artists do you represent that are, who are sculptors? Uh, let's see. I wish I had another laptop here so I could see my home screen. I can count them up for you. I see one, two. But you can get a number. I'd say ten uh, percent. And how many of them are working in with you know bronze or you know pricey materials? Uh, we've got one. The guy in England works in bronze, small cast bronze, lead filled sculptures. Who they takes are, care of shipping on a situation like that? Uh, well, they're small. You know, they're, they're small. So it's not particularly an issue. So I, they're easy, you know. And how much is, does Large it cost? Bronze, although I, we, we just, I, I shipped out to California three huge bronze uh, wall reliefs that uh, my Elisa Engelhart, the collector in California, bought. And I just, you know, you, you arrange for a, company to come and crate them and it's at the collector's expense and and they build a crate and pick them up and shop ship them out does the cost of the bronze casting affect the split yes it does uh, how do you do that the artist uh, usually takes their costs out and then the split happens so typically the artist is paying the cost of fabrication casting. in this case yeah i mean it depends I, as you go along if you become well known and there's a high demand, you could probably have a you know blue chip gallery that would put the money up for you because it's in, in their interest for you to make work. Uh, but initially, usually the artist pays. But uh, but in either situation, the person who pays gets reimbursed before yeah, they get fifty fifty. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Does the cost does that factor weigh on who you represent? Um. No, I wouldn't say so. Is, is sculpture harder to sell than painting? Yeah, it is. It is now. The, the golden age was in the late 80s. I don't know. I, sculpture was really easy to sell. Back. Do you feel like you have to love a sculptor more than a painter, therefore? <laughs> uh, no, no, it's just, it, it's, it's also, a, it's become storage. There's like an issue with storage, with sculpture. Once the show is over, you, you can't like just put it in a rack usually and you can't um, keep it around. You know, you can only maybe put one piece in another office and then, and then you're sort of reliant on doing studio visits with a collector, which, you know, you, you, 
they're pretty far down the line. Usually they're going to buy something by that time anyway, before they even make a studio visit. So it's, it's, it is, it has a certain downside. I mean, there's, there's logistical problems that, yeah, make it a little more cumbersome. Painting is easier to deal with. Is the gallery deal in secondary market sales? Secondary market are pieces that are not sold for the first time. They did the resales, like somebody I brings them into cooning. No, no, no. I have no interest in that. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to go work for Nodler. They do a lot of that. Do you show art or work with artists who you don't represent? Only in the group shows. In group shows, yeah, 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 basically. Interesting. Okay. Um, what about the gallery and art fairs? Um, it's funny. Art fairs didn't really become a big thing until they started in, with Chicago in the 80s. And uh, all those years, I mean, Grace was a good gallery and she certainly could afford to do art fairs, but she didn't. Instead, she sent me out and I went out there and spent five days and uh, tormented you <laughs> and others and uh, made connections and got artists that we represented at shows in Chicago and San Francisco and L.A. because of my efforts, you know, uh, with slides in the old days and uh, networking with people. But uh, we ne I've never worked for a gallery that really – uh, had big success with uh, we did we did the Arco in, in with Grace Borgnick in Spain, and only because we had a Spanish artist that we, we showed there in the booth we sold something, but it was at best it, with all the expenses it was a break even situation, and uh, with my predecessor to me with Elizabeth they tried some art fairs she and I tried some art fairs in the beginning. In, from 2005 to 2007 or so. Uh, and we would just find it's cheaper to stay home. You know, we already pay the rent and uh, we do better just from our inside of our brick and mortar factory. Um, I, uh, we are considering maybe doing Dallas though, that uh, yeah. sort of a new area because I mean, I think Miami is completely overstimulated. There's too many things going on, you know. It's like we did that, and it was just too much, even too much to go see, to choose what to go see. So, um, could you foresee a situation where you'd see a work of art in a restaurant or something and go, "Oh my God, that's awesome!" and seek out that artist? <laughs> well, uh, it's funny you should say that. Uh, there's a restaurant in Red Hook in Brooklyn uh, called Kevin's, and uh, and was sitting there and I was looking at this work and I said, this is really familiar. It's modernist kind of work. And then the name says Ray Parker. And I said, well, wait a minute. It couldn't be Ray Parker. He's dead. And sure enough, it was. Uh, the, the cook, Kevin, is married to his daughter. And so, uh, you know, there was a thing. There was a flyer there on the bar from Washburn Gallery who represents his estate. And uh, these paintings belong, I guess, to either the estate or to the daughter, and they're displayed in the restaurant. But not, that's not a fine. But I mean, <laughs> here's a here's an example of first-rate work being in a restaurant, so to speak. Uh, but no, I, I uh, don't. There were d things in East Village that was a popular thing back in the '80s. Uh, people would uh, get tabs, and they would do restaurant shows or bar shows, and. Uh, in exchange for curating it, uh, the curator would get a tab at the bar or so or at the restaurant. And some, you know, there was some good work that was displayed in those shows, but I don't go to restaurants looking for, for art, per se. How do you communicate with most collectors? Uh, by telephone or uh, by email. Olga, I, I've been asking people's questions, but Olga, I want Olga, Olga maybe because she's in Norway. Um, and it's really late, so she gets special privilege. Olga, go yes. ahead and ask your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I've spoken uh, with one gallerist, the, the owner of the gallery in Norway, and, um, uh, and what I asked him is, uh, uh, how should we uh, artists uh, choose uh, galleries we want to contact to? Uh, should we uh, look at their portfolio uh, first and then uh, evaluate 
if our works uh, can be set in in the in the gallery's uh, portfolio. Uh, because like f for my works, it's pretty difficult. I I do not see uh, I see just one gallery in Oslo who mm -hmm. uh, w which could be interested in this sort of works because the rest is more like abstract and I do more figurative surrealistic stuff right. uh, so this gallerist at least his meaning was um, uh, that uh, no I should contact everyone <laughs> uh, yes. because it's good for for a gallery to to show a wide variety of works and be a kind of unpredictable and uh, uh, right. You be know. more interested for 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 different sorts of collectors what, what do you think uh in a short answer i agree with him um because um uh, it's a delicate question that you ask because a lot of artists say i curate a show based on abstraction then every abstractionist that sees their work as similar to those that were in that show they send me solicitations and say, oh, I, I fit in your gallery and so forth. But that's not necessarily what we're looking for. And uh, I do agree with you. The best galleries are ones that have a, a eclectic, divergent uh, nature. And, uh, and I've been involved with many galleries like that. So therefore, uh, I, I try to broaden our horizons as well as, and I think other galleries should as well. So. I mean, I think you should evaluate all galleries, just decide whether you think they're, uh, you know, honest. You know, like Elizabeth, she pays all of her artists. As soon as something sells and she receives the money from the collector, she sends them a check. Some galleries don't do that. And that's the most important thing you want to find out if the gallery is an honest gallery by talking to people that show their, you know, reputation in, in the art world, people that go to the openings, et cetera. But I think you should... It, uh, there's a limit there's I don't know like a dozen galleries and there's probably a lot of new ones since I've been in I was in Oslo in January uh, but uh, I didn't really go to galleries though I was looking at other things um, but, at the beach. Uh, <laughs> yeah the beach <laughs> the opera I was on the beach at the opera in the wind always holding on for dear life but no I think uh, you you should approach many galleries and not necessarily think that your work fits in with their program because that's not always what they're looking for. In fact, often that's the reason that they're not going to be interested in you. Hmm. Let's take and the last then, question. I'll go, go, go ahead and finish and then we'll do one more. No, j just very short. Uh, artists who you find difficult to deal with, what, what kind of difficulty uh, you're well, talking about personality issues or they're they're demanding or you know they're just you know um, make what we think are unreasonable demands or you know I mean you have people in your life that are difficult just think about mm -hmm. how they're difficult it's the same it's just human interaction sometimes it's just not a good mixture you know they they see things a certain way and they want it done that way and that's not what you, you want to do so that's what I mean by difficult. Mm. Um, I, I don't mean that their, their work is difficult. Uh, difficult work is not a problem. It's just difficult personality. <laughs> it's more about personality. I mean, it's easy, you know, you just want to be able to, you know, have a good relationship with your artists and, uh, you know, have a sense of trust and, uh, you know, confidence and so forth and not have uh, acrimony. <laughs> trying to avoid that so. let's do a last question miles and that is um about studio visits what 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 do you look for in a studio visit and what do you recommend well personally when artists get their studio like pristine and try to make it a gallery i think that's uh they're they're just wasting their energy i, I like a, a little messier studio sort of get some indication of how they work uh, you know, so you, to see the process, so you don't really have to clean up your studio, just, you know, make the work uh, you know, presentable and lit as well as possible, given the means of the lighting that you have in your studio, and uh, um, don't, you don't have to explain everything, I like just to look, I, 
uh, in my early years, I used to take a friend, coworker with me on a studio visit. And this guy was a very chatty guy and he would chat with the artist. So then I could just look and I didn't have to, you know, I could ask a question if I wanted to, but I could be on my own. So uh, it's nice to offer some a beverage, you know, some seltzer, or water, wine, depending on the, the time of day. And, uh, you know, just uh, realize that the person that's coming in, they, you know, don't feel slighted if they only spend 25 minutes because they've been looking at work for a long time and they see what they need to see. And, and if they're interested, they will pursue you. You don't have to pursue them. So. Sounds good, amigo. Um, right. I think that's been a really, a lot of really good information. I appreciate it. Um, we could go longer, but I've got another guest that we're going to do another webinar with momentarily. And I really appreciate all that you've shared. Um, let me unmute everybody. Uh, while I mute it, everybody say thank you to Miles. Thank you, Miles. Thank you, Miles. Thanks very much. Thank you, Miles. Yeah. All right. I've, I've muted everybody again, and I'm stopping.